Ni hao. My name is Reid Hoffman, and I thought that I would use my self-introduction to explain how identity is changing, how the world of work is changing, and what that means for entrepreneurship today. So if you look at a classic CV, which is what I have here, where you say, okay, this is my identity. I'm a co-founder and chairman of LinkedIn, I'm a partner at Greylock, I'm an investor in Facebook, a board member of Airbnb, part of the founding team at PayPal, and a graduate of Stanford University. And typically, identity would be, you know, here is essentially my CV, my resume. This is how I get a job. This is how I get financed. You know, this is what identity was, you know, essentially before. But identity is changing. And identity is changing to essentially being it's, we're part of a networked world. It's the question of how we connect with each other. And at LinkedIn, we talk about this as the economic graph. Essentially, how people, companies, universities, skills, jobs, and opportunities all come together. And so as opposed to a CV representing me, this is how I'm represented. And these are the details by which you begin to think about how is my world composed? How am I effective? How do I actually get good things done, make good decisions, find good investments, invent new products? And it's all through working through folks in a network. And these, this is how everyone does. It's not just me. This is all of us. Now, how does that affect entrepreneurship? Because the classic story, well, the classic story when you get to kind of a networked age, which is what, kind of what we're, we're living in in terms of how we're all connected, the classic way that this affects entrepreneurship is that entrepreneurship is you have an idea, it's an initial thing, you get a couple people, and then if your idea is good, it works. However, what's really important these days is not actually, in fact, uh, the, just the startup, but is actually the scale-up. It is how do you build great, world-transforming companies. And this is actually, in fact, what is the challenge behind, you know, before modern entrepreneurs. And the networked age makes it uh, much more relevant. Now, in Silicon Valley, this is the emoticons from iOS, from the bestiary. These are so important that we've pulled out specific terms to represent how important these scale-up companies are. And as you can see, both of them are in the iOS emoticons. The first, the one on the left, is a unicorn. And that means a billion dollar company. And obviously there's a lot of, there's, there's many more unicorns in the networked age than there were before. The one on the right, a dragon, is a, is, is a company that's worth tens of billions of dollars. And it essentially makes a venture capital fund. And that's essentially the thing that, uh, the, the networked age has now made more possible. Now, the thing that's interesting is when you begin to look at all of these major companies, so this is a list of the 15 public internet companies, you say, well, five of them come from China, although there's a bunch more coming as well, and eight of them come from Silicon Valley. So if you think about being in a networked age and you say, why is it that in the entire globe, there are two regions of the world that generate almost all of these companies. And the two that aren't this are other US companies. So let's consider private companies. Now, Meituan will be needed to add it to this list, obviously. But you also have four from China and seven from, Sil from Silicon Valley in California in specific. Now, this is phenomenal. This means that in the entire globe, there are these two regions that are creating all of the dragons, you know, a majority of the unicorns. Why is that? And in particular, let's, let's start, start with where there are similarities. Because the similarities essentially allow for what creates these massive scale-up companies. The first part of it is there's large local markets. What that means is an entrepreneur only has to build a product that essentially works really, really well in the local market in order to get to sufficient scale 
to build the giant trees, the forest of a company. The second is that there's entrepreneurial cultures. And part of entrepreneurial cultures is a willingness to take risk, a willingness to be bold, a willingness to try something, fail, and try again. Both China and Silicon Valley do this very well. And essentially financing climates where you can do scale venture capital. And part of scale venture capital allows you to essentially uh, grow to being very big and very fast. And both China and Silicon Valley do that very well. And a depth of technology talent. Again, when you look everywhere around the world, China and Silicon Valley are the two places that tend to have the most technology talent in terms of what gets, um, uh, how you can compose these companies. And finally, the startup ecosystem, uh, which is, you know, by the way, both competitive here. All of you know China very well, know how intense the competitive, but that competition also exists in Silicon Valley in terms of thousands of startups all competing. And then the ones that work thrive, and the other ones recombine in other companies. They may be purchased, they may pivot, they may change into something else. Now, the most interesting thing is, is how do we actually now start, what are the differences, and what can China and Silicon Valley learn from each other? And an interesting part of the high line of this is to consider that there's 1.4 billion people in China, and there's 4 million people in Silicon Valley. So part of in creating these massive companies, there's actually some very significant differences about how these massive companies are created in a way that allows uh, them to learn from each other and to have different uh, uh, kind of uh, games, different skill sets, different playbooks in terms of how they're gonna, they're gonna function. So let's start with China. And I've been coming to China since 2004, and uh, one of the things that, uh, that has been incredibly impressive to me about meeting entrepreneurs here is the pure hustle and speed and vigor by which Chinese entrepreneurs operate. Because most of the time when I'm going places in the world, Silicon Valley is fast. Well, China is faster. Uh, it's one of the things where you had uh, Xiaomi uh, started with what was called their 996 policy, which is 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week. You're supposed to be at your desk. Uh, Derek Shen, who's our president of, of LinkedIn China, uh, got our new product, Qi2, launched by essentially uh, bringing the whole dev team to a hotel for two two-week sprints as they were getting it launched. That's the kind of thing that we don't do in Silicon Valley. And when I saw it, I went back to Silicon Valley and said, we should start thinking about doing this. This is one of the things that Chinese are doing that's really good. There's also a deep pragmatism. One of the things that, of course, is frequently said is, oh, yeah, a lot of Chinese entrepreneurs you know, copy. Actually, I actually think there's a ton of innovation here. I think there's a ton of, of actually inventiveness. I think WeChat is one of the, uh, the clear leading communications platforms in the world in terms of uh, communications client as a platform. But part of it is pragmatism. It's what's the quickest, you know, most effective way that I can essentially get to that goal and make it work. And that kind of pragmatism is actually one of the things that I find to be uh, deeply and uniquely uh, Chinese entrepreneurial. There's also a massive talent pool. And part of that massive talent pool leads to a different play for how companies massively scale. So in Silicon Valley, we don't have this talent pool. Everything has to be done in a, in a pretty narrowly thread, smaller organization. Part of what happens, for example, here in China is when a startup starts going and starts hitting some product market fit and getting scale, uh, it'll start hiring people in multiple cities very fast. That never happens in China, uh, sorry, never happens in Silicon Valley. In Silicon Valley, it tends to be grow within Silicon Valley until you literally cannot grow in Silicon Valley anymore before you move to another city. But this talent pool allows you to uh, essentially have a large number of people to tackle a problem, and therefore it has a different kind of scaling technique. And I've seen it in, the, in you know, Cheetah Mobile, I've seen it in a, a number of different uh, Silicon, uh, sorry, Chinese companies. The next thing is the size of the market in terms of people. For example, one of the things that I do frequently when I come to uh, China and other interesting entrepreneurial uh, uh, countries is I meet with local entrepreneurs. 
and, uh, and I would get pitched on an idea, and it would be something like, well, I'm going to do furniture delivery for, you know, online furniture delivery. And I was like, well, isn't that a vertical market? Isn't that really small? Wouldn't that be something that you shouldn't do? And it's actually, in fact, well, it's 50 million people, <laughs> right? The, the pure market size allows for a number of different interesting opportunities that can be pursued here in China uh, uniquely, and then you get to critical mass, and you can then potentially take that into the world. And the final part of it is every business type is available. There's investing in farms, there's investing in hardware, there's intensity on O to O. All of these things are things that, when I've seen them in China, I go back to Silicon Valley and I say, this is super interesting and super important. It's things that we should learn from, since we try to learn from great entrepreneurial ecosystems like, like China. So now let's consider Silicon Valley. So Silicon Valley, uh, has been doing this for a few decades, does this with four million people. Part of what uh, is really key to how Silicon Valley works is networks, which is really important in the networked age. It isn't just Guangxi or relationships, but it's actually, in fact, uh, one of the classic things that happens is whenever you're talking to other people in Silicon Valley, you're constantly introducing each other to people who would help solve a specific problem. Even people, even when you're talking to your competitors, you're doing the same thing. That network is, in fact, very deep. There's also deep tech capabilities. When you go to Silicon Valley, the startups aren't just mobile apps, which are extremely good and actually better here in China, but extremely good. There is artificial intelligence, virtual reality, space exploration, biotech, uh, nuclear uh, startup, uh, uh, energy. There's all of these things, and they come from the universities and the corporate research labs. Also, Silicon Valley companies are or have a global focus by default, which means that most of them, some of them focus only on the US, but almost all of them actually start going global almost as soon as they launch. For example, once Facebook went beyond colleges, it actually went to every country and actually developed a language app by which its own users put it in every language in the world. And corporate development, which I'm gonna go into in a little bit more depth, one of the things that's different now, obviously, with the Meituan and the DD mergers, this is beginning to happen in a different way here in China. But part of what happens in Silicon Valley when you're looking at building these really strong, great companies is they actually do specific acquisitions to make major strategic opportunities. And this is one of the things that I actually think that you will see more of in China in the next decade or two because it's such an important playbook for the networked age. And finally, the talent flow between companies is really important. So for example, in Silicon Valley, when one company is beginning to scale, it will essentially start recruiting uh, employees from the other companies that have already scaled in the last generation. So for example, when Facebook uh, was starting to grow or LinkedIn was starting to grow, we started recruiting from Google because Google had solved these kinds of problems. And this is part of where I think there's a really interesting opportunity for China and Silicon Valley to learn from each other. And why this is important is because when you consider the networked age and you consider all of the unicorns and dragons that I just talked about, though, like, there's a reason why there's basically three internets that matter. There's a Chinese internet, the global English internet, and then everything else. And part of that is that you essentially say, we have uh, these entrepreneurial ecosystems for building these massive companies have a possibility of having this global scope. And there are some other important ones. Uh, you know, for example, you know, Japan and Germany and Korea and Russia have in integral markets. India is obviously growing. But China and Silicon Valley learning from each other have this possibility of, con of constructing even more of the dragons, the major companies that will help bring a whole bunch of technology and, and prosperity to the world. So one of the things I'm doing is I'm teaching a uh, class on this uh, at Stanford, uh, and we're calling the term blitzscaling. And the reason we're calling, I'm calling it blitzscaling is because essentially uh, it's, it's off this German term blitzkrieg, which was invented in World War II, which is the speed at which you operate. And uh, what happened before the Germans invented Blitzkrieg is that they, uh, essentially, armies would only advance as far as their supply chain. So the moment that they got to the edge of the supply chain, they'd stop. And that was the speed at which they would operate. But actually, in fact, what the Germans said is, that, well, actually, if you pack really lightly, 
and you essentially said, all right, only as much as you can carry, move really fast, and you win or lose big at the end, that's essentially what these Chinese companies are doing and what these Silicon Valley companies are doing. And part of how they invent uh, essentially blitzscaling is that they, uh, they, they essentially kind of say, okay, how is it we get customer acquisition? We use mobile, uh, we use the internet, uh, we use internet plus as a way of making these things happen, and how do we do customer support in a different way? We'll use email, we'll use WeChat, we'll do these, these mechanisms in order to make this happen. And like, for example, Xiaomi is a perfect example of this, because Xiaomi said, all right, uh, in order to scale a new, really interesting hardware company, let's first use Weibo during the early parts of Weibo in order to create a direct selling presence, a direct brand connection, and a direct, you know, uh, uh, a way of essentially getting the customer and not having to use lots of retail partnerships. We get essentially a lot of free marketing out of this. That's all of the things that actually, in fact, happen. And then let's use WeChat for customer support. And those kinds of innovations are the precise kinds of innovations that enable blitzscaling to, uh, to actually happen. And so what I'm doing at Stanford is that uh, we're doing a set of lectures. Uh, these lectures essentially are going to be available. Uh, by the way, they're going to be available here in China as well on, on, on QQ video. Uh, and, uh, and essentially, it's uh, a, the people who have built these companies in Silicon Valley, what we've learned from Silicon Valley. Now, let me talk a little bit about the talent part of it, because the talent is one of the things that I think is, is in fact, actually uh, transformative. So I wrote a book called The Alliance. Uh, it's available in Chinese. And what it details is how we manage talent flows between companies. And part of the talent flows between companies, not just executives, but also managers and employees, will work at multiple companies within Silicon Valley within their career, multiple good companies, not just kind of the, the great companies hiring from the less great companies, but actually move around between them. And part of what that enables is the whole ecosystem collectively learns. It's like a network of learning. And uh, part of what that enables is, for example, when Sheryl Sandberg, who uh, had worked at Google, had built uh, essentially the AdWords business, uh, was considering what she would do for her next gig. Uh, she essentially said, all right, well, now I will uh, I'll actually go to Facebook. I'll be the COO. And that's part of the thing that then brought to Facebook a knowledge of scale, a knowledge of how to build a large ad network, a, lar uh, an, uh, a, a function of how to build the Facebook audience network. And what I said in the alliance is that the way that we do this in Silicon Valley is we, we identify tours of duty and a notion of transformation, of how you transform an individual's career and how you transform, essentially, a, um, uh, a company. And that mutual transformation, a discussion, uh, an alliance, is part of how this happens, and it's part of the reason why, you know, uh, Cheryl had a great career at Google and then a great career at Facebook, and this is a kind of a classic pattern. And this is also part of the reason why I founded LinkedIn. Because part of what LinkedIn says is your identity is not just your profile. Your identity is the network that you're embedded in. And that network is what makes you essentially uh, effective. So for example, if I were to go back and tell my younger self how to do something differently, I would have said, emphasize your network. Like, understand that the people that you build these alliances with, that is actually, in fact, where your identity changes. That is, in fact, how your world of work changes. And that is actually, in fact, how your entrepreneurship changes. So for example, the, the key inflection in my own career was from the fact that Peter Thiel, who is the CEO and co-founder of PayPal, and I were friends at Stanford. We just argued philosophy together. And so when he started PayPal, I was part of the founding team of PayPal. And so the, <clears throat> the class is essentially going to be available in QQ online. And um, uh, with that, uh, we think we'll now move to our next speaker. Thank you.